The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Howdy folks, this is um, um, Jeff Probst from uh, modx.com. He's a senior Linux administrator there. Uh, I've known Jeff for a long time. He's, um, he was Captain Obvious Man on IRC, but he's gotten promoted, and this is now Major Obvious Man. <laughs> Stand and salute. Come on. No, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've known Jeff a long time. He's a good fellow, and he's going to give us a uh, good presentation on the recent Heartbleed SSL vulnerability. There you go, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's see if I can do this. Can you guys hear me? Is this coming through? Is it on? OK. So thank you very much, um, person who's not Rob. <laughs> uh, thank you for the introduction. Today we are going to be talking about the Heartbleed vulnerability that came out in early April. If you wish to follow along with this presentation or want to refer back to it, I have a permanent copy up here. The address is here at the front, uh, self2014.grimoire.re slash heartbleed. I also have a link to that at the very end in case you forget about it or you didn't get to it in time. So today, we're going to be going over Dell, apparently. Hang on. There it is. We can't touch this, apparently, so I'm going to move this a little bit here. Move that down. OK, I think we're good now. So today, we're going to be going over what is the Heartbleed vulnerability. We're going to explore it in depth, probably more than you may want to. We're going to explore what the impact and implications of the bug were, and uh, discover how it was mitigated and how it's been fixed in the wild. So, we need to go over some definitions so we have a basic vocabulary to speak about when we're discussing this, um, starting with what SSL is. It's a protocol that provides a secure communication channel for data transfer. They're usually used with HTTP, which is what everybody's using for web content. We wrap SSL around HTTP so that that content can be delivered securely. And a lot of these servers are using a tool called OpenSSL to do that delivery. This is our basic working knowledge here. There's a lot more that could be covered in here. And in fact, tomorrow, I will be going over two sessions about that very thing. So if there are some questions you have about SSL, its operation, some of the assumptions or things that I've said, come tomorrow, ask questions after. There's lots of opportunities to learn here. So let's talk about what it is. It was a vulnerability in OpenSSL's implementation of something called the heartbeat function. The heartbeat is a new feature introduced in a recent version of OpenSSL, or in the, uh, excuse me, in the SSL protocol, which is designed to just basically be an, are you there? Yes, I'm there. And it keeps the SSL communication channel open. We want to do this because opening a new channel is very computationally expensive, it takes a lot of time, entropy, and randomness to calculate all the values needed to create a new SSL channel. And again, we'll talk about that tomorrow, but, uh, just take that one to the bank. What happens is the client requests a heartbeat from the server, and it includes any string at once. It could be some numbers. It could be what the data is. It could be, I really like hot dogs. It doesn't matter. The server responds with the same string, proving that the connection is still open and that they're listening and that no one else is interfering with their messages. The problem comes in with this function here, the heartbeat process function. It receives a data structure with two very important items. First is the string that the client gave it. And second, the length of the string, as stated by the remote client. It then creates a new data structure, which it sends back to the client. It's basically just doing a simple copy of RAM. The problem is that it doesn't do it very well. It doesn't verify that the length of the string that the client gave it is actually what the client says it is. So I could do. Um, I don't know, glasses, which is six, six characters long. 
but I could tell it that the string is 400 characters long. And this becomes a problem because since it doesn't verify that those links match, this heartbeat process function could copy more data than it was supposed to. It's called a missing bounds check. It's pretty common in C programming, especially when you're dealing with pointers and slinging them around all over the place. Sometimes you just forget to check this bound or that. And sometimes when you forget, that sometimes is in a very crucial place. So here we have an illustration from XKCD. A lot of you probably have already seen this, but this is perhaps the best illustration I have of what the heartbeat function is. Here are users sending a heartbeat of the word potato, and their server at the bottom responds with potato. She does it again, this time with the word bird, noting that they're different characters. Well, the server responds with bird, so then she tries again. Let's do hat, but this time we'll use 500 characters, and the server responds with hat, and the following 497 characters after that, which it's not supposed to. This, in a nutshell, is the Heartbleed bug. Let's dive into some code. <clears throat> I'm very sorry about this. I don't know why it's doing this. Here we go. The function first appeared in version 1.0.1. .1. I believe they were trying to hit a 1.0 release, but didn't get it in. There's the actual code, and there's the actual file. So you could go and download OpenSSL's Git repository, read through it, and find the exact commit where it was erroneously inputted. And in fact, that's happened before. This is the actual function itself, um, highlighting a couple of the important parts. The first box at the top there designates that's the data structure that this function is receiving from SSL. Uh, the second box shows that it's picking the payload out of that data structure. And the third box is showing that it's getting a count of this, what the, the data structure says is the size. There we go. So then what it does, this, this uh, second part of the code, it calculates how big the new data structure needs to be based upon the size, the reported size of the payload on the client and the other values that it has. And then that bottom box there, it just blindly copies memory. It doesn't do any bounds checking. It doesn't do any fact checking. It just copies. Mm, that's, that's painful. This is what we call in an industry a big oops. It's a very technical term. So what we see is that whatever data is in RAM immediately after that string gets returned to the client erroneously. And anything could be there. I mean, honestly, anything. It could be just zeros. It could be uninitialized memory that's never been used since the system booted up. It could be junk. It could be session data of another user's request. It could be hashed password data. Yeah, that happened. It could be SSL private keys. That happened, too. Any of these things. It could be operating system data structures. It could be anything. You don't know. What you get is basically a raw copy of whatever was in RAM after that point. And you get 64, up to 64 kilobytes of it at a time. That's, oh, that just, that's painful. And it gets worse. The memory address of the data structure is not fixed. So every time a new data structure response is crafted, it could be somewhere else in RAM. This means if you do it over and over again, you could conceivably get different sections of RAM all over the place. Yeah, that's even worse. Let's go check out this uh, example here. This is a proof of concept server that someone put together, which is running a vulnerable version of OpenSSL for the purposes of us being able to see what's in its RAM. There's a lot of information here. And again, this link is in the presentation, so you can go play with it yourself. Down here, simulate the attack. This is a section of interest here. We're going to click on this URL. He's doing us a favor. He's actually hosting the attack code on the same server for us. Let's go poke at this. Maybe. Do you want to have Jeopardy music handy? <laughs> All right. Well, I, um, I saved a copy of something that I found last night. Yes, thank you. You can come up and shout this into the microphone if you want. This is the actual response I got last night when I was playing around with this. Uh, 
Yeah, let's see what I can do here. Um, make everything 20. Is that easier to see? Yeah. Okay. So he, um, in the attack code, he did us a favor here. He set up a random cookie with some funky characters for us. And that way we can kind of search through RAM to see if we can find it. Here, yeah, this up at the top here is just some SSL information. Here we can see that he requested several different things. He requested here a heartbeat length of 16 KB. Let's go check out what he's got. Let's see, a bunch of junk, bunch of junk, bunch of that's not junk. That looks like, ooh, yes, this is a response from a recent request to the website. Oh, look, here's the cookies. Right here, the WordPress cookies that are built in allow you to stay, keep your session logged in. So using this information right here, from there to here, I can pull that out of RAM. I can masquerade as somebody else's WordPress user. What happens if that user is an administrator? There's no way to know without masquerading and seeing. But it was that easy to pick that information out. I only had to refresh this once or twice, and it randomly assigned somewhere in RAM, and I got this information. Who knows what you get? Try it again. You can get just about anything if you're patient enough. The rest of this we see is just <coughs> junk. This is uninitialized, uninitialized RAM here. A whole lot of it. Yep, a whole lot of it. Okay, there we go. Oh, and this is this is more text from the attack script telling us, hey, sure enough, the server is vulnerable. Thank you, text. Yeah. Where did my oh there we go? There we go. Oh, look, there we go. It finally came up. Let's see what's in this one. And you notice the data is different here. Again, different location in RAM. It's a different time. Who knows what's in RAM at this time? Well, we can see here. This is, I don't know what. 2014 is, a, is the name of a WordPress theme. So it looks like we're looking into PHP code, perhaps. Hmm. Yeah, this is some code here. I don't see a whole lot of in interesting stuff in this one. But it's important to recognize, oh, here we go, we're getting something. This is completely different than the data we just looked at. And if I refresh it, we get different data again. Here we go, here's more blank RAM. I can refresh it again and again and again. And every single time, I have a good likelihood that I'll get different data. If I keep refreshing, I keep attacking, I can, I can almost canvas the entire RAM. Hmm. And it's a little bit worse than that. The SSL mechanism, as I said, we're wrapping HTTP, we're wrapping SSL around it. Um, so the SSL layer happens first. And then after SSL is established, your HTTP connection happens. Only problem is there's usually no logging done at the SSL layer. It's just assumed that it'll pass through and then you can do your logging at the HTTP layer. So that means if an attacker knew about this bug and was using it on your server, they could do it over and over and over again, and you wouldn't know. You have no way of knowing that the server is being attacked. You might notice that the load is spiked up to 40 because someone keeps causing you to do SSL connection computation. Remember, we said that SSL connections are computationally expensive. You might have indirect evidence that something was going on, but you wouldn't know that this is what was happening. This is very not good. Very, very not good. What happened? It was uh, reported, the vulnerability was reported on the 8th. They knew about it on the 1st, but for fear of for, um, April Fool's, they didn't want to release this really enormous attack. And everybody would just say, oh, April Fool's, no. So they waited a little bit until they had some more verified code. But since it was published in 2011, this vulnerability could have been used for years. Uh, the version of OpenSSL that came out was in I think October 2011. So you've got almost a year and a half where this bug could have been discovered by somebody, been used in the wild, and again, because no one is logging SSL, you wouldn't know. Yes, sir? Wasn't there someone that ran um, IDSs in the many box and they, um, they were able to go back their logs for two years and find that prior to April that they did not see any traffic dealing with parts of the their servers? So it probably was not being at least a widespread use 
Mm. Probably not. Um, at least to that server. Who knows what that server was? Who knows what was on it, whether it was worthy of attacking? It's just one of those things about information security. If you find a vulnerability that, especially one as big as this, as easy to use as this, you don't tell anybody. And you save it for the times when you need to use it against that one really critical target, the government server that you've worked three months to get into, something, anything like that. So yes, we have data points that say it wasn't being used in the wild, but we don't have data points for all servers. So that is a very valid point, though. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on bigger uh, server farms, that's very true. So you have some sort of device or devices sitting in front. Again, because SSL is computationally expensive, we don't want that going on on the actual web server itself. So for some of the bigger sites, they're doing the SSL on a different server entirely. So you're still getting RAM pieces out of that server. There's still information that can be harvested, but maybe it's not as critical as if you were hitting the website server itself. That being said, this is the kind of thing that could have been stolen. And in fact, there were proof of concepts done that they were stolen. If you get the private key of an SSL certificate, you can decrypt every bit of information that has been sent across. You know, you can record. So this is this worst part. You can record a transaction that you don't know how to crack, but you can keep the bytes from it. And then three months later, let's say you crack the private key for whatever source. You can then go and use the private key, start at the beginning of, of the transaction, and replay the entire thing. So your communications for the past 10 years that that private key was active are vulnerable. So it's not just a moment in time if, if someone is recording everything. And if, if you're under surveillance, they're just going to record everything as a matter of story. So they can also use that private key to create a duplicate SSL certificate which matches everything. It is, in fact, a, 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 an exact copy of the SSL certificate that's in production. And then you can do man-in-the-middle attacks. And no one will ever know that they were attacked because the SSL certificate is an exact match. You won't know. It's one of the reasons why this bug is so scary. Let's talk about who was hacked. One of the earliest announcements was about Yahoo Mail Services. And they've been in the news before. They've been caught leaking users and passwords in cookie data. They've been caught being sloppy with credentials and not following modern cryptographic methods of salting and hashing and yada, yada, yada. So it's one of the first things that these security researchers targeted. And sure enough, it wasn't too hard for them to pull, they pulled hundreds of usernames and passwords out of the RAM of the server before they turned it off. Again, they were just trying to prove it. They didn't actually want to get into those accounts. They needed to prove that the code worked. In Canada, the equivalent to the IRS was attacked. Now, this was an actual malicious attack. Uh, some genius was able to grab enough ID information for 900 different citizens and then could use that to log in and download their information. And then you can use that to attack their bank accounts and clean those out. Thankfully, he wasn't very good at covering his tracks, and he was caught. He's uh, currently being prosecuted for some ridiculous number of uh, crimes against computer security. And then we have Cloudflare, who didn't actually believe that Heartbleed was a really big thing. So they posted a challenge that said, OK, fine, here you go. Here's your server. Go at it as hard as you want and try and crack the key. It only took them nine hours, which mm, that's, it seems like a long time. But when you're dealing with 2,048-bit to encrypted communications and you can crack it in nine hours, that's that's a holy grail right there. So not only did this guy crack it, he was able to do what we talked about in the last slide. He crafted a duplicate SSL certificate, and then he used that to encrypt a payload message saying, this is my name, and I have cracked the, you know, cracked the SSL certificate. And then he gave that information to Cloudflare. Once they figured out what they'd done, what he'd done, they immediately canceled all of their SSL certificates and reissued them again. So this is real. It was used. Uh, it probably still is being used against those servers which are still vulnerable. And yes, they're out there. In fact, there was a, a study done about a month ago showing that the number of vulnerable servers to Heartbleed has gone up since the announcement because people were erroneously updating their copies of OpenSSL to the hacked version. <laughs> so it got a little bit worse. Now, I understand that that 
is getting better over time because this bug is so impactful. Uh, server admins that are running uh, open servers are quietly getting emails saying, hey, you've got to fix this. So what happened afterwards? Immediately after the bug was announced, all the distributions posted an updated package for OpenSSL. They didn't have time to go diving into SSL sources. You saw just snippets of it. It's quite dense. Um, you pretty much need a master's degree in Austin in order to understand it. So what they did, they did something far simpler. At the beginning of the snippet, here, let's see if I can go back to that. You might have seen right here at the very top, there's a little define, no heartbeats. So they took the easy route and they said, fine, we'll, we'll hit that flag. We'll recompile it, which takes all of the heartbeat code out. Yes, we know it's a part of the protocol. Yes, we know it's useful and it's being used for things, but it's vulnerable. We can't have that in there. So the first thing they did was to take the heartbeat functionality out. Organizations began to revoke their SSL certificates. Uh, this is really difficult if you've played with or issued SSL certificates. It's annoying to get the vendors to play ball with you. And the vendors don't want to do this because they have 50,000 clients which all want to revoke and reissue their certificates. Each one of those revocations and each one of those certificates cost them entropy, time, manpower. They don't want to do it. Uh, the guys that have the certificates don't want to do it because they may have 15 certificates across their in infrastructure. They have to go and cancel each one, make sure that they're on the revocation list, yada, 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 yada. It was a really enormous pain. Some organizations still haven't done it. I haven't done it on mine. I'm too small time to care. But OpenSSL patched the vulnerability in a later version of the software. Um, and we'll look at that patch in a second. And then once that patch was published, the distributions in whatever version they're distributing in that particular instance backported the fix. And then they recompiled it again, re-enabling heartbeat. So now you have the fixed heartbeat code. And here, oops, I forgot one more important point. This was me. The day the heartbeat landed was a very, very long day. And afterwards, about 10 PM, when I finally was cooling off, uh, yeah, I don't really remember that night. <laughs> it was a long night. It was a long day. Here's the actual patch in code. They added two bounds checks, because one wasn't good enough. We wanted to make sure this was doubly secure. So the first one makes sure that it's not flat out lying and is too small. The second one makes sure it's not too big. The second one is the one that was actually the vulnerability everybody was using. Both of these bound checks work together. And you notice at the bottom here, return zero. An invalid heartbeat request is now just silently thrown away as if it never happened, which is what should have been what happened to begin with. So let's talk about if you still have a system that isn't patched, you don't have to raise your hand. I'm not asking you to out yourself. Um, you know who you are. Um, here's how you go about fixing it. And then there are some people who think they're patched and they're not. So all these instructions, go ahead and pay attention, even if you think you're fixed. Make sure you're up to date on the latest version of OpenSSL, or if you compile your own code, you're on at least that version, 1.0.1G. And then, after you have done that, you have to restart your web server. Because if you don't, then your web server is still, the binary for that is still in RAM. It's still linked against the old version of OpenSSL, which is in RAM. And so you think you have patched your server, and ah, ha, ha, we have patched it. And you are one of the guys like me who value uptime. You haven't restarted your server in six months. It goes for another four months after you've patched your server. Those entire four months, your server is still vulnerable because you haven't restarted your web server. So when you stop and restart your web server, when it starts up again, it goes and finds the new version of OpenSSL, and it brings that into RAM. And it links that against, it get links against that copy and not the faulty copy. So this also raises the question of, oh, there we go, that's what I just discussed there. Any other tools that are also linked against OpenSSL, you need to apply the same procedure. And you can do that using this tool called LSOF, List Open Files. Now with no arguments, it literally lists every single open file on your Linux system you have, which is kind of a lot to wade through. So use grep and trim it down to only instances of this library. You can use this simple little code to make sure that 
when you're doing this restart step, you catch everything. You restart every single service that was linked against OpenSSL. Then and only then will you be completely protected from heartbeat. And there's one other thing that I didn't cover. I meant to at the very beginning, but this was pointed out to me. Why did they call it the heartbleed bug? Well, it's the heartbeat function, and it's bleeding RAM, like any number of analogies that I can make here. That, and they needed something sexy to grab attention. It's really unfortunate that it doesn't matter how big the bug is, it doesn't matter how big the vulnerability is, people won't be goaded to move or do anything unless it gets wide media attention. And so they actually spent the time between April 1st when the bug was first reported on April 8th, when it was actually reported to CVE, building a website. You can think it's heartbleed.ch or heartbleed.com. They even have decals, they have images, they have all sorts of content. This took time to prepare. So for seven days, they spent their time making it nice and sexy so it would be picked up by all the media, because that's how important it was. And we could debate the merits of them waiting or not, considering the bug has been out in the wild for two years, I think another seven days may or may not have been a huge deal. Again, we can debate that later. And that comes to the end of my presentation here. If you have any other questions or comments about uh, this particular bug, I'd be happy to entertain them. Yes, sir. I don't actually know the particulars of that little interchange. There may have been something there that they knew about the code and they weren't able to get anybody to fix it. It's, oh, I'm sorry. The question was asking about uh, the BSD project wanting to fork OpenSSL into a new project called LibreSSL. And he asked for any comments about uh, that operation. And the, the timing is suspicious on that. Uh, I don't actually know the transaction particulars. Um, it does seem awfully suspicious to me, too. Well, because it happened on, like, the mm -hmm. same weekend, like, that they, that the fork was uh, decided upon and that the bleed, and that the bug was found. And it could be that they were tired of bugs coming from OpenSSL. We can do better, maybe. Well, there's been several other bugs since that have been fixed. Uh, there's always bugs being fixed all the time. <laughs> Usually they're not as bad as this. Uh, just a second, sir, I will get to you. Yes, sir, in the back. Could you speak to the uh, ramifications of smaller devices like embedded systems, like, uh, like browsers and stuff that use, uh, that use SSL and what the impact is? Because obviously the patches, if they're, there's not necessarily always going to be a mechanism in place to update those, those embedded devices. Where is the impact going to be? How long are we going to see the impact of, of this? The question was for embedded devices that are using the OpenSSL library, what is the impact given that it's difficult to update them in place? Um, a lot of those devices that would ship a vulnerable copy of OpenSSL, you may just have to write them off. A lot of their owners may not know that they're, you know, they're vulnerable. They may not know the exact software that's running on their devices. A lot of times that's hidden from them. So that entire class of electronics for the last two years that may or may not be using uh, the broken version of libSSL, you almost have to write them off. As a responsible um, business owner, I might try and reach out to my customers and tell them, hey, we had this enormous bug happen. Your device may be vulnerable. Here's what you can do to try and patch it. As a responsible business owner, I may not be able to afford that. I don't know. I'm not in that position. That is a very good question, though. And it's really unfortunate that those devices will have to be looked, about, looked at with suspicion from here on out. Uh, yes, sir, your question. So my observation of this was that probably most of the question mix was basically one person was responsible for 95, 98 of the information in the file. Mm -hmm. Very on demand, and I think that how do we do it? We probably need lots of junk calls. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of talk, and that's why I think the, the previous team came in and said, hey, we said, why is so many commercial companies depending on this big rollout of code? not really fulfilling standards. 
much, much bigger than the big book. Yes, sir. Um, his question and statement was about how much this, this uh, software is used everywhere by tons and tons of companies, individuals, organizations, people that may or may not know that they're using it. And it has been in the past run by, I think it's four guys total. It's done almost all of the commits. And it's been a little wayward. It's, the development is slow. Now, cryptography is not really advancing. We're advancing our ciphers. We're advancing a better way to create a random number. We're not really advancing how we're doing key exchange or how we're doing hand SSL handshaking. So that code doesn't really need to improve much. But still, it takes forever to get a patch into the OpenSSL project. His statement was that uh, this might contribute to some of the uh, worry over companies that they're so dependent upon this one piece. What has been done, um, a consortium has been founded that will now lead the OpenSSL project. It's getting actual funding. Um, I can't remember the companies that were involved. Several big name companies have all put up a couple million dollars a piece to found. Mm -hmm. uh, the news splashed about three weeks ago, I think, that this was happening. So uh, as a result of this bug, one of the Im good improvements is to the process of the development of OpenSSL itself. Now it will be uh, more independently audited. In fact, part of the fundraising for the consortium was so that they could pay for an organization to go through the code line by line and find any other bugs like what was in Heartbleed. Um, yes, sir? Is a similar thing being done for OpenSSH? Question was, is a similar thing being done for OpenSSH? I would imagine that uh, companies are tar starting to look at all the projects around them and, and reevaluating their risk. And OpenSSH is another one that's high on the list, saying this could use some financial support to make sure that it's done right. We depend upon this for everything. Uh, smart companies with deep pockets, that would be a wise thing for them to do. Sir? Not this particular bug. We will discuss, in my presentations tomorrow, we'll discuss okay. Okay. certificate revocation lists. Okay. That was a great lead-in. Thank you. And I totally didn't pay him off. That was organic. In the back. The question was uh, discussing how the, the bug works both ways. The same Heartbleed bug is visible both in servers and in client libraries. And so the question was about what to do about a server, a malicious server, using the Heartbleed bug on a client. Uh, once an SSL communication channel is already open, there's nothing to stop a server from sending 10,000, 10 million heartbeats. You have computation power. But it could send 10,000 heartbeats if it wants. Um, and I have not heard nearly as much press about the client side uh, in general because OpenSSL or SSL is treated as a system layer thing. And I can imagine that Microsoft and the distributions, well, the, the Linux distributions, when you patch your libSSL, that's, you know, it works for both server and client. They're using the same library. OS 10, uh, Apple probably had a field day, all of your little iDevices, all of your cell phones, anything like that. Sir. Oh. Okay, great. Okay, so Internet Explorer and Apple products no longer use OpenSSL. And Chrome and Firefox auto That was a whole lot of interchange there. I apologize for the, the viewers later on. 
uh, basically confirming various devices are or are not vulnerable. We concluded that uh, Chrome doesn't use the OpenSSL library except on Linux, so any Chrome users on non-Linux platforms are safe. Android devices, however, cannot be updated, and they are using OpenSSL. Is that what you're saying? I think there's, you can't update some of the old policies, and that might mm. be 10% of the policies. Okay, so then. The other thing to that note is all of the old phones are going to be on the code.9.8, not 1.9.1. Right. Just because they're old. Right. The only vulnerable version of Android is 4.1.1, like literally that one. Okay. So the only version of Android that's vulnerable 4.1.1. If you have any of those devices, then you're going to need to go update them. But 4.1.2 should be delivered over the air. If it hasn't already, probably has. In the back. That's correct. The question was, uh, you wanted to confirm that we, we discussed here that there was a client attacking a server, but the same vector exists when a server attacks a client. Um, yeah, that's exactly what we're saying. Um, I didn't cover that here. That was a very good point. I thank you all guys for bringing it up. It's, that's how big this bug was. That's how important it was, and that's how many people were affected by it. Sir. So what I think, too, is similar. I believe, I mean, all SSL, right? So SSTP and IMAP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mail servers. Well, in the process of hitting, in the process of you could run into the mail server RAM, you could, yeah, you could, um, if you patched just your web server somehow, let's say you compiled against different versions of OpenSSL, your mail server could still be vulnerable. That's why that last step there asked you guys to check through your open files and make sure that anything that has libssl open, and it may not be libssl on your distribution. That's what it is on Red Hat. Um, I think maybe it's. I don't know what it's called on uh, Ubuntu with the packages. The actual file. You go and find the, the open files and make sure that everything is good. Um, do we have any other questions? Comments? Concerns? Anybody feel like getting up and dancing? Because it's the end of the day. Rotten tomatoes. <laughs> let's, let's avoid the rotten tomatoes. OK. Let's all get up and dance, because we are done with the presentation. Thank you guys for coming. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail.
Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.